the book of 1 Samuel uh, is a transition book between the time of the judges and the time of the kings. And uh, we are introduced to Samuel uh, last week by Hannah, uh, dedicating this child, uh, Samuel, to the temple to be trained under Eli, per se, and to grow up as a servant of the Lord. And Samuel actually... Uh, is introduced to us as a prophet. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, uh, the Bible says, So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. All of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And Samuel opens up and starts this prophetic mystery that we will see uh, till the day of Christ's return. Now, there is a blessed honor in the prophetic ministry, and I believe that it's still a function in the church today. The challenge that I think we have is in our day, we have what we, I would call the self-proclaimed prophet. Now, these are what I would call people that say, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord didn't say it. And now, listen, the example that we get of Samuel here, it says the Lord established Samuel as a prophet not Samuel himself. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, the Bible gives us clear description of the role and responsibility of the prophet of God. And you must know your Bible to be able to clearly determine whether a prophet is actually a prophet of the Lord or not. And a couple of main points, I'm going to encourage you to go back and read that chapter on your own, but a couple of main points in Deuteronomy chapter 13 is this. A prophet will never teach or give instruction contrary to God's word. That's Deuteronomy 13, verse 5. A prophet will never entice you to go and worship another God or worship differently than what is instructed by God in his word. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. And a prophet speaks, if he speaks a word and it does not come to pass, then he is a false prophet. And the Bible says he should be stoned. That's Deuteronomy 13.10. I think some of our self-proclaimed prophets of today who have said, Thus saith the Lord, and it hasn't happened, uh, they don't like that part of the Bible. But anyway, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, and we taught through this book uh, last year. Go back in the website and uh, review those studies if you'd like. But Paul taught us in chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. There are a lot of things in religion today that sound good, but the question is, are they from the Lord, and are they biblical? Listen, you must know your Bible, and to know your Bible, you need to actually read your Bible. I want to encourage you, if you're not, if you are, great, but if you're not, follow along with us as a church as we read through the entire Bible in a year. The daily Bible reading schedule is on the website, or if you don't have access to that, email or text us and I'll get it to you. Um, make it a goal in your Christian life to read the entire Bible Read it through every year. Listen, you just can't go in and pick and choose what you would like to believe or, or, or read or follow. The Bible needs to be taken in its entirety. Now, last week we read of Hannah's de devotion and commitment to the Lord. We read of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, and their evil ways. They were taking the best of the sacrifices of the Lord for themselves. They were having sexual relationships with women that were coming and serving at the temple. And they just manipulated and threatened the people uh, that came to worship. In verse 12, it says, uh, of chapter 2, it says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt, and they did not know the Lord. Now to think that these two guys were serving in the tabernacle, and they did not know the Lord. That's a scary thing to think about. In verse 17, it says, Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, and for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Listen, people were afraid, and they didn't want to come and worship. 
This is a horrible act on the part of Hopney and Phineas, and God's judgment will fall on them in chapter 3, and we'll get to that next week. Now, the Lord spoke through Moses warning about consequences of sin for Israel. In Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, he said, But if you do not do so, take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure that your sin will find you out. We can never think that our sin will not bring consequences. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, some of you know this verse, Paul writes, For the wages of sin is death. Listen, when you sin, you're going to get a payment for that, right? We go to work. We work and we get wages back. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And these two guys, Hopney and Phineas, it is no different. Please understand not, that God is not watching you with his hand held up, getting ready to smack you when you do something wrong. That is not our Father. Sin brings judgment, and the reason that happens is because God is just. God is righteous. It's a principle of sowing and reaping. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 16, Solomon writes, The labor of the righteous leads to life, but the wages of the wicked to sin. God's plan from the beginning was relationship with his creation, and that's you and I. Christians are not perfect. Look around. You can tell that we all aren't perfect. I've told you guys when I first came here, you hang around with me long enough, you're going to find something about me you don't like. And that's pretty much true for all of us. But there's one thing about believers that's different. We are forgiven. God is doing a work in our lives because we have asked for that forgiveness. And we have submitted our lives to make Jesus our Lord. Hophni and Phinehas will soon come to terms with a righteous God. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, the writer of Hebrews says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Jesus came to save us and deliver us from our sin and the penalty of death from our sin. All we have to do is receive it. So let's continue with 1 Samuel chapter 2. Where we're going to pick up in verse 22 where we left off last week. And Eli was very old, <clears throat> and he heard everything his sons did to all of Israel, and how they lay with women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And so he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not good a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Now, we see something here. <clears throat> now, these guys are older and they're doing something, but we, we see a little bit of a flaw in Eli. Eli struggled in his parenting. Uh, and we see that by the way his boys are acting. Eli chose to talk more than teach and discipline. Sometimes action is needed, and we need to be willing to take that action as parents. Parenting is very difficult, and frankly, the Bible really doesn't give us a lot of instruction in parenting, but what it does give us are some valuable principles that we should focus on. So we're going to take a minute and focus on four principles about parenting from the Bible. Number one and two kind of go hand in hand, but I've separated them because I've got one verse that backs them up. Number one, we are to teach our children. Number two, we are to be an example to our children. Number one, teach our children. And number two, be an example to our children. And I get that from Deuteronomy chapter four, verse nine. The Bible says, only take heed to yourself and be diligent to keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. So number one, teach our children. Number two, be an example to our children. Number three, discipline our children. Now, some of you have heard this term, spare the rod, spoil the child. I just want you to know that that's not in the Bible. 
spare the rod, spoil the child. Here's what is probably referenced by two verses in Proverbs. Proverbs 22 verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Makes sense? Chapter 23 verses 13 and 14 of Proverbs, the writer says, Do not withhold correction from a child. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now, these verses have been misrepresented in the past, and they are still misrepresented scriptures today. So before you call social services, I want you to think about something for a moment. Turn back in your Bible to Psalm chapter 23. And when you get there, I would like you to read this out loud to yourself with me, okay? Verse 1, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, we're focusing on one verse, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, why does the rod and the staff comfort us? Well, because the Lord is just. And when things get out of control, God brings control. When things get out of line, God puts things in line. When things get in disarray or in disorder, God brings order. Correction makes things right again. Now, are you getting this? Listen, the rod of correction, correction makes things right. This is teaching our children what is right and what is wrong. So number one, remember, teach your children. Number two, be an example to your children. And number three, I hope you have a good, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but understand, Discipline your children. I hope that gives you a little bit of a different perspective of what those words mean because we've misinterpreted those. And number four, it is our job and our responsibility as parents. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says this, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath or to be angry, but bring them up in the training and admonition, the care of the Lord. Paul also said in Colossians 3, verse 21, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Is disciplining your children supposed to be some kind of rage and anger or abuse? No, it's not. Yet, listen, we of all, anybody that's parents have struggled in this area, and we could spend a lot more time here. But I pray for you as parents that are still going through raising your kids, and are navigating through teaching and raising them, read and pray over these scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you. And understand something, the chances are you're probably doing it wrong. Because I'm going to tell you what, I've Missy and I look back, there's a lot of things we did wrong. I wish we could do them over again. I think by the third child, we've got things a lot better, but man, forgive my, man, my daughter Allie, the first one, she got the brunt of parents not knowing what the heck they were doing. And I... <laughs> That's pretty much all of us, isn't it? But listen, trust me, you are not alone. Uh, Missy and I have been there, and there is, one, there is never one answer that fits all of the challenges of raising kids. Our example of a father and of parenting is our Heavenly Father. Whether you had great parents or bad parents, that's irrelevant. Our example is God the Father. And our responsibility as believers is to do it God's way. Proverbs 14, verse 26 says this, In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, right? And his children, you and me, will have a place of refuge. The Lord teaches us, corrects us, loves us, 
And because of this, we have a place of refuge in him. We want to have that place of refuge with the Lord, don't we? And listen, and we want our kids to have that place of refuge in our home as well. And as parents, are we promoting anger and bitterness or are we teaching our kids how to do things God's way? Listen, if we're promoting anger and bitterness, you know what we're teaching our kids? Anger and bitterness. So number one, teach your children. Number two, be an example to your children. Number three, discipline your children. And number four, it is our job and our responsibility as parents to do these things. So listen, Eli not only struggled with parenting, but he also struggled with being a good boss. Now, these two boys happen to be his, but they also happen to be working for him as well. He is the high priest and his boys are working for him and he is not correcting their behavior. In Eli's words in verse 23, look at it. Turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Eli is asking them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. Is it because Eli has no clue what's going on under his own nose? Well, maybe. <laughs> but Eli shouldn't be hearing this from the people, but he is. And he does nothing to correct the problem. And it says here that his boys are causing the people to transgress. Now listen, that word transgress is the Hebrew word that means to pass over. Now get this, because of the sin of his boys in the tabernacle, people are passing over the tabernacle. They are avoiding worship. They're avoiding God. Eli tries to explain to them that they have to answer to God for their behavior in verse 25, but it says, nevertheless, they didn't heed the voice of their father. Hophni and Phinehas have no respect for the Lord and no respect for Eli, their father. They don't care. Now think about this. What are they getting out of this? They're getting the cream of the crop of all the offerings that are brought in, which are supposed to be the Lord's, and in doing their job, quote unquote, they are having sexual relationship with women that are coming to serve at the temple. And this should not be happening. In their eyes, things probably look really great. Because remember, it said before, they don't know the Lord. Hopni and Phineas are examples of living in the flesh. They have allowed the fulfillment of flesh to determine their way of life. Look at the end of verse 25. It says, because the Lord desired to kill them. Now, that can sound pretty harsh, but let's understand what that means. We must understand the character of God here. God is not wishing to kill anybody. God is love, we all would agree, but God is also just. The simple mean, uh, this, this simply means that God will be just to Hopni and Phineas. Now, think about this. Could they have repented? Well, sure they could have, but they didn't. And we must remember something. In the midst of all that is going on, there is a young boy in the midst of all this named Samuel who is learning and serving the Lord in the middle of this mess. Can God work in messes? He sure can. As, as much disappointment as we have seen with Eli so far, and I've kind of picked on him a little bit, he is doing something right because he's raising Samuel in the things of the Lord and we see in verse 26, read that verse. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. And Eli was a part of that. Mom and dad are visiting every year. And I'm sure that Hannah, his mom, uh, is praying for her son that the Lord would use him in a mighty way. And Samuel is growing up and learning the things of the Lord. Let's go down to verse 27. <clears throat> Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, right? Prophet, thus saith the Lord. Let's see what happens. Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt and in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer my altar, to burn incense, to wear the ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? He's talking about Aaron 
and the descendants of Aaron being the high priest. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the blessings of all the offerings of, the, of Israel, my people? Why are you doing this? Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I indeed, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and, your, and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off on my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. <coughs> now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. And one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my, before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please, put me in a priestly position that I may eat of a piece of bread. Now, this is a very detailed prophecy given to Eli. This man of God, we don't know his name, comes and specifically gives clear prophecy about Eli and the consequences of all that has been going on. <clears throat> Number one, he talks about the job, the job of Eli being the high priest. God called Aaron and his lineage to fill the role of high priest with specific instructions and this guy is calling Eli out, so for some reason, we have to determine that Eli probably isn't doing these wholeheartedly. Number one, to be God's priest. Being God's priest means this, to minister to the Lord first before he served the people. To offer sacrifices, that's atonement and worship on God's altar to the Lord, not to people or not to himself. To burn incense. Incense brings a wonderful aroma, right? And it is what prayer to the Lord does. Burning incense and prayer to the Lord. This is another one of Eli's responsibilities. Wearing the ephod. That is representing the Lord in his glory and his beauty. So we have to ask ourselves a question after reading these things. This prophet has mentioned these things to Eli and saying, listen, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So let's ask ourselves a question. What is God's call or instruction on my life? Now I want to give you a verse. You can look it up later. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. It's pretty simple. And we need to start doing those things. Number two, he gives the responsibility of Eli. Verse 29, he says, Eli honored his sons more than he honored the Lord. And this is idolatry. Question we have to ask ourselves. Is there something that we are doing allowing or allowing to take precedence in our lives over the Lord. Is God your first priority? Matthew 6, 33. Write that verse down. Number three, verse 30, this, uh, this prophet is giving what appears to be an exception to the rule. God's promise was that the line of Aaron would always hold the position of high priest, Exodus chapter 29. But because of Eli's disobedience, Eli's lineage will be removed. <clears throat> now this happens later in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 27, when Solomon removes Abiathar from being high priest. He's the line of Eli, and he replaces him with another guy, Zadok, who's still in the line of Aaron, uh, but is from the family of Eleazar. These are promises from the Lord, and this is an example of one that the Lord makes an exception for, right? So the Lord is, is saying, listen, this was my promise, but I'm, I'm, I'm changing this. I'm doing something different here. 
Sometimes in this instance, the Lord does this because of disobedience. Sometimes, like what we just read in the book of Ruth, he made an exception for Ruth the Moabite because of his grace. So here's a principle we have to understand. Sometimes there's an exception to the rule, but the exception is never the rule. Because it says, because the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me, I shall be, shall be lightly esteemed. The Bible says in another place, listen, I'm God, I can do whatever I want. And we have to acknowledge that God can do that. And it is not our place to question or judge why God changed his mind in this situation. He's explaining it clearly, but there's an exception to the rule here. God is God, and he can do whatever he wants. I think often people uh, will get more focused on finding a loophole in, instead of just being obedient and trusting the Lord. I think this is the question sometimes we ask ourselves. How can I get as close to sinning as possible without actually sinning? Now, that is completely the wrong attitude to have. And here's what we have to ask ourselves. The challenge is this. We accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And we are all about the Savior part. Forgiveness of our sins. We get to be with Jesus for the eternity and we don't go to hell. We're all about that Savior part. But we struggle with the Lord part. Because something will come up and we have to ask ourselves, do we trust him as Lord? Will we be obedient to his instructions because he is our Lord? You have to listen, when, when God, we see something in God's word, and we answer the question, no, Lord, with what we answer, no, Lord, you realize that that's kind of an oxymoron, because if you're saying no to the Lord, he's not your Lord. So this man of God explains that Eli's house will not prosper, and he uses the term, I will cut off your arm. Now, thankfully, this is not literal, but in the Bible, the arm is always a picture of strength and might. And the implication here is that Eli would be left powerless and without strength. He says, and there will shall be an, uh, an old, there shall not be an old man in your house forever, but any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. All the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. So what he's saying here is this, no member of Eli's family would ever reach a ripe old age. They're not going to live a full life. And he says, now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, Hophni, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. Now we will see this confirmed in chapter 3. And listen, this prophet has been giving Eli a very detailed prophecy about what's going to happen to Eli and his family. Now again... I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to mislead anyone. I am a firm believer that God has people in the church that are prophetic. But frankly, most of the nonsense that I have heard from so-called prophets is very generic and it's doom and gloom. Uh, or they say it needs some special interpretation. And frankly, that is all nonsense. Because listen, write these verses down about being prophetic. Verse, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. Peter tells us this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. We've got to be clear. That's what the Bible says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, but he who prophesies, right, speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. The Bible is very clear about prophetic words. Now, you're going to ask me the question. You're going to say, well, this doesn't seem to be very uh, edifying and exhorting to Eli. Well, it would be if he would repent. Think about it for a moment. Verse 35, back in 2nd, 1 Samuel chapter 2. He says, then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. Again, this prophecy is fulfilled. If you want to make a little note on the side of your Bible, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 27. Uh, King Solomon removes Abiathar from being high priest and appoints Zadok. 
um, removing Eli's line. Verse 36, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. Listen, you never know how good you have it until it's taken away from you, right? That grass is always greener syndrome. Here's what you have to remember. When people always say, well, the grass is always greener, you always think, well, things would be better if I had what they had or I was over there or I was doing this. Listen, here's where the grass is always greener. Where you water it, you fertilize it, you work it, you clean it up. That's where the grass is always greener. Deal with what God has given you and stop trying to get something else. Listen, if you're not responsible for what the Lord has put before you, how in the world are you going to be responsible for anything else? And listen, Eli's family was once living off the Lord's provision and they will be begging for a piece of bread. And that's what sin does to us. It looks so good. We are tempted with fulfilled, uh, fulfilling all the desires of our flesh. Isn't it amazing how the devil knows our weaknesses and he knows where to attack? Listen, if you struggle with lust, then what's probably going to happen? All kinds of things are going to come before you to tempt you to give in to that lust. If you struggle with pride, uh, the enemy will put things and people before you that will tell you what and why you deserve better than what you have. A personal problem I have, if you struggle with eating potato chips with crisp, listen, I go to the store and it's like at the end of every aisle, there's some kind of chip display tempting me to buy those chips because if I buy a bag, and I open it, I'm going to eat the whole thing. But we, by the grace of God, can say no. Did you, under, did, you, did you know that? Did you know that you can say no to temptation? We do not let the, please do not let the enemy convince you that you cannot say no. Nor let him convince you that you will die if you don't get what he is tempting you with. God used Eli in spite of his failures. But what more could, would God have done with Eli if he would have been a faithful servant of the Lord? What if Eli would have repented and corrected his sons? What more would God have done in this time of moral decay and destruction? Remember, this is the time of the judges. Everyone is doing what is right in his own eyes. We can sometimes look at these examples and think, well, it eventually worked out. God is gracious, right? Before you answer that question, turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. And we're going to read through the end of this chapter and a couple of verses in the next chapter. Please follow along with me. Romans chapter 5, verses 20. We're going to start there. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as, as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, that who died to sin live any longer in it. Drop down to verse 12. Therefore, get this guys, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it and its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Listen, God loves you, and God wants to do a work in your life. Is there a sin that you're struggling with? Can I encourage you, confess it to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to fill you up and to help you. Find people that will encourage you in your walk, to help you walk out, your faith in Christ. Call me, call Missy, call Steve, call Cherry, call somebody. We will do whatever we can to help you and point you to Jesus. Do not let pride keep you from walking in victory. 
because that's just what it is. Pride will, will eat us up because it makes you think, well, I can do it on my own. Well, they won't understand. Well, they can't help me. Well, how do you know if you don't ask? And, and here's, the, here's the really sad thing. The creator of all the universe, the creator of you and I, the Bible says, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. But we won't call on him because we have already predetermined that we are either worthless and don't need help or that God can't do it.